This is section 4.5, and what we're looking at here is derivatives in the shape of a graph. What we really want to do with this section is look at a function and its derivatives and how they compare with each other, how they interact in order to produce a graph. So let's jump back to section 4.4 and look at corollary 3. Corollary 3 said if f is continuous and differentiable, so it's a nice function, the derivative is positive, the function's increasing. If the derivative is negative, it's decreasing. So we can determine which direction the function is pointing by looking at its derivative. Another way to think about that is the derivative itself and whether or not the derivative is increasing or decreasing. So when the derivative is increasing, the slopes of the tangent lines will be increasing, so the graph will bend upwards. When the slopes of the tangent lines are decreasing, right, so we're going to draw a little graph, we look at the tangent lines. The tangent lines, we'll put in some of those slopes. Maybe that first one, we're just kind of eyeballing it. Maybe that has a slope of you know, 4, and then the next one is maybe 1. And then we have a negative, maybe it's negative 1. And then we have that steep negative, maybe we'll say that one's like negative 5. So here I can see that the slopes of the tangent lines are decreasing. So the second derivative must be negative. So I have that bend down shape. Another way to look at that is that the, the graph lies below its tangent lines. So we could draw another graph. This one goes the other direction. Right? So I look at these tangent lines, and I can see that these slopes of the tangent lines are increasing as I move from left to right, which means that that second derivative is positive. Okay. So, uh, so if that second derivative is positive, that graph is going to have that bent up or concave up shape, and the graph is going to lie above its tangent lines. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at four different little pieces of graphs. Okay. On each piece what we want to do is just look at whether or not the function is increasing, decreasing, or concave up and down, and what that looks like. So in this first one, the derivative is increasing, or sorry, the derivative is positive, so the function is increasing. And the second derivative is positive, so the derivative is increasing, which means that the function, the original function, f, is concave up. Okay. And so on that graph, we get this you know, first example of a graph that's going up and also bending up. In our next little graph, the derivative is positive, so the graph is increasing. In this example, though, the second derivative is negative, so that means that the first derivative is decreasing, which means the graph has this bending down or concave down shape to it. Okay, in this third example, the first derivative is negative, so the original graph f is decreasing, and the second derivative is also negative. That means that the first derivative is decreasing, and so the function f is concave down. And then on this last graph, we're going to look at the function, uh, sorry, the derivative f prime is negative, so that means that the function is decreasing. And the second derivative, in this case, is positive, so the graph has that bent up or concave up shape to it. Let's go ahead and look at an example. Um, here, f is x cubed minus 3x squared minus 9x minus 1, and what we want to do is find all the relative extrema, find the y-intercept, we want to find out where the graph is increasing and decreasing, where the graph is concave up and down, and we want to sketch the graph of the function. So let's start with the y-intercept. Here we just want to look at where is the, what is the y-value when I plug 0 into the function. So we plug in 0, and we see that the output is negative 1. So 0, negative 1 is our intercept. X-intercepts are sometimes hard to find. We don't want to spend a lot of extra work finding them. These problems are already kind of long. So we won't typically find the X-intercepts when we're doing these graphing functions. We're just going to kind of, you know, let them be. All right, now that we've found the intercept, let's go ahead and look at the first derivative, f prime. And f prime, we first have to compute, right? So using the power rule, f prime of x is 3x squared minus 6x minus 9. The derivative of that negative 1 is 0, so that, that's gone. So now we want to figure out where is f prime equal to 0. So 
I set that f prime that we just computed equal to zero and solve, that's going to tell me where I get my potential critical points, right? Where the graph might be, have a maximum or a minimum. So we're going to solve by factoring, factor out a three, and then factor further to an x minus three, x plus one. So we get x minus three could be zero, or x plus one could be zero. So x could either be three or x could be negative one. Okay, so the way that we're going to figure out where this graph is increasing or decreasing, is we're gonna draw a number line with that three and that negative one on it. And we're gonna test a value from each of those remaining intervals into the derivative. So for example, negative two is to the left of negative one. And when I plug that into the derivative, not the original function, but the derivative, then I can see that uh, I get negative naught. I plug negative two into the derivative, not the original function, but the derivative. So we plug negative two in, we compute, and we get 15. So now let's try another interval. So in between negative one and three, we pick something. I'm gonna pick something convenient, that would be zero. So we plug zero in, and we'll just get negative nine in the derivative. And finally, something bigger than three, I'll just plug in four, and I plug four into the function. Uh, remember the derivative, here I'll compute and get 15, and that's positive. So we got a, a positive, that's increasing, a negative shows me decreasing, and a positive is increasing again. So I'm not gonna write down the, the derivative as positive or negative, I'm just going to draw what that looks like, the increasing and decreasing, so I don't get confused later with more information. Okay, now let's look at the second derivative. So I'm going to erase this stuff, and let's look at f double prime. Let's start by computing f double prime. That's the derivative of f prime. So use the power rule again. So we get six x minus six. And then we wanna find out where six x minus six is equal to zero. So six x minus six equals zero. So six x equals six, so x equals one. And so I get one value where the second derivative could be zero. I'm gonna go ahead and add that in to my line graph. And because I'm adding it in, I don't want to get confused with where my derivative is increasing or decreasing. So since I've put in a new number in there, I've broken up an interval into two pieces. I wanna make sure that I'm decreasing on both of those pieces. So now we're going to look at where f prime is positive or negative. So one was the only value, so I just have to test both sides of one. So again, a convenient value to the left would be zero. I plug in zero, I get negative six, that's negative. So I know that it's concave down on the intervals to the left of one. When I plug in something bigger than one, I'll get positive six. So I know that it's concave up on those intervals to the right of one. Now we know on every piece of the domain, whether the function is increasing and decreasing and whether it's concave up or down. So let's go ahead and draw a graph. When I draw my graph, I wanna start by plugging in information that I know for sure. I know the intercept when x is zero, y is negative one. I'm going to label the important numbers, uh, negative one, one, and three. I'll go ahead and throw two in there just to keep things sort of you know, nice and neat graph and now I need to figure out what to graph each piece what I'm going to do is draw the shape that each piece has on the intervals that I've broken up so on this first interval it's concave down and increasing so I have this bent down shape but I have the rising side of that so I'm going to draw the increasing but bent down or concave down the next piece it's bent down but decreasing so I draw the other half of the concave down and I've concave up and decreasing, and then concave up and increasing. So those are the pieces that I wanna draw on each of my intervals. Now what I wanna be very careful about is zero is not a endpoint of one of my intervals. So when I go through my y-intercept, I wanna pass right through it, I don't wanna pause at that point. So we go right through that y-intercept without stopping from negative one to positive one. After positive one, uh, we pick up again and we draw that bent up but decreasing shape. 
Okay, so that we'll have a minimum at 2. And then finally, after 2, it's bent up and increasing, so we finish off the graph that way. Okay, so let's look at another example. f of x equals cosine x minus x on the restricted domain negative 10 to 10. And we want to go through all the same steps that we just did a second ago. So let's start with the intercepts. Uh, the y-intercept is going to be where plug 0 in. So f of 0 is cosine 0 minus 0, which is just 1. Okay, so we have uh, 0, 1 as our, as our y-intercept. Okay, now let's go ahead and look at the first derivative. So f prime of x, when we compute the derivative of cosine x is negative sine x, and the derivative of x is 1, so we have negative sine x minus 1. So let's go ahead and figure out where that is equal to 0. So I have negative sine x minus 1 equals 0. So I add 1 to both sides to get negative sine x equals 1, or sine x equals negative 1. And I use my inverse trig uh, function to uh, get x by itself. So sine x, sorry, x equals sine inverse of negative 1 plus 2k pi. Okay. And I can also get pi minus that value. So pi minus sine inverse of negative 1 plus 2k pi. Remember that when you take the inverse trig function, it splits into 2. So now we need to compute sine inverse of negative 1. You can remember it from your trig days, or you can use your calculator. And when you plug that in, you should get 3 pi over 2. So we have 3 pi over 2 plus 2k pi, or pi minus that pi minus 3 pi over 2 will give us a negative pi over 2 plus 2k pi. Okay, so now let's figure out which of these x values out of the infinitely many we have, which ones are between negative 10 and 10. So if I take negative 3 pi over 2 and I subtract multiples of 2 pi, let's suppose I subtract 4 pi, right, when k is 2, then what I'll end up with is negative 5 pi over 2, and that is between negative 10 and 10, so that works. If I subtract 2 pi, I'll have negative pi over 2, which is also our second set of solutions. So I can see that the two sets of solutions actually line up. If I don't subtract anything, I have 3 pi over 2. That works fine. If I take 3 pi over 2 and I add 2 pi, I get almost 11. That's bigger than 10, so that's no good. So my three x values are negative 5 pi over 2, negative pi over 2, and 3 pi over 2. So those are the x values that I want to put on my number line. So let's go over to our number line, and I want only information between negative 10 and 10, because that's my domain. So we'll put in the negative 5 pi over 2, pi over 2, and then the 3 pi over 2. And what I want to do is test something from each interval. In order to compute where this function is increasing and decreasing, it might be a little bit easier to have a good number sense for where things are. So I'm just going to quickly write down a decimal approximation for negative 5 pi over 2, negative pi over 2, and negative 3 pi over 2. So when I want to plug in a decimal approximation, so when I want to plug in and be to the left of negative 5 pi over 2, I can do something like negative 9, and I compute and I get negative 0.578, sorry, 0.587, that's negative, so I can see the function is decreasing on the first interval. Okay, the next interval is in between negative 5 pi over 2 and negative pi over 2, so between negative 7 and negative 1, and so I can put in negative 5 into the first derivative, and I compute, and I get negative 1.96. That's negative, so the function's decreasing here also. On the next interval, I'm in between a negative and a positive number, so I can just plug 0 in. And when I plug in 0, I get negative 1. That's negative, so it's decreasing on this third interval. And now we go to our last interval. I need something bigger than 4.71, so I plug in an x value, say 5, into the first derivative, and punch it in my calculator, and I get negative 0.04. And so I see, oh, okay, that's negative. So this function is actually decreasing everywhere. 
never stops going down. It might flatten out at some points, but it doesn't stop going down. Okay, now let's look at the second derivative. So, the second derivative will tell me about concavity and also inflection points. Okay, inflection points are the points where concavity changes. So, the question didn't ask us to label inflection points, but we could do that very easily if we just look at our end result and say, oh, okay, if it changes from concave up to concave down, that's an inflection point. Okay, so let's look back at our first derivative, negative sine x minus 1. I differentiate that, and I get negative cosine x minus 0, or just negative cosine x. So I want to figure out where the second derivative is 0, so I set negative cosine x equal to 0 and solve. That's the same as cosine x equals 0, or x equals the cosine inverse of 0, which is pi over 2. So we have pi over 2 plus 2k pi or negative pi over 2 plus 2k pi because I'm solving a cosine function. Okay, so I need to figure out which of these x values is in between negative 10 and 10. So I'm going to do the same process that we did earlier where I start writing these down. So I want to be systematic about it. I'll start with the pi over 2 and just subtract multiples of 2 pi. So pi over 2 minus 4 pi as a decimal is negative 10.99. That's not my interval, so I throw that out. Okay, so now I will subtract 2 pi from pi over 2, plug that into my calculator, I get negative, well, let's, okay, back that up. So simplifying that's negative 3 pi over 2, and plugging in my calculator, I get negative 4.71. That's fine. So now we take pi over 2 as it is. I just want to look at its decimal approximation really quickly. So I get 1.57, okay. and now we add 2 pi, pi over 2 plus 2 pi. First, if I write that down exactly, I get 5 pi over 2, and the decimal approximation is 7.85. Okay, so that's my interval, but if I add any more, then that's going to be too big. Okay, so now let's go to the negative pi over 2, and again, I want to start by subtracting out piece. So if I take negative pi over 2 minus 4 pi, uh, that's negative 14 and change. No good. Throw that out. So now we take negative pi over 2, subtract 2 pi, which is negative 5 pi over 2, and as a decimal, I get negative 7.85, so that's okay. So now we take negative pi over 2, uh, Plug that in as a decimal, negative 1.57, that's good. And so now I take negative pi over 2 and add 2 pi, so that's 3 pi over 2. And then I plug that in to get my decimal approximation, and I'll get 4.71, so that's fine. But if I add another 2 pi to that, that's going to be a little too big, so that'll be out of my interval. So I get these six values. So we have to plug all six of them in. Some of them are overlaps. Some of them already exist in here, right? So if I look at negative 5 pi over 2, that's already on there. But negative 3 pi over 2 is not, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add that in. Okay. And what I'm going to do is just cross these out as I go. So now I need to put in positive pi over 2. 3 pi over 2 is already in there, and I put in 5 pi over 2, and I'm just going to erase those extra arrows. Okay, I have a lot more intervals now. All the intervals that I had from before that got split up, I want to make sure I put the decreasing on. Right, Everything was decreasing, that made it a little bit easier. But if I had an example where it switched, I wanted to be careful and make sure anything I split up was uh, the same thing in both of the new pieces. Okay, now we need to test intervals into the second derivative. So since we already have the decimal approximations written down below, I can see what numbers I need to plug in. So we're going to start with negative 9. That's to the left of negative 5 pi over 2. So I plug that into the second derivative. When I plug in negative 9 into the second derivative, I can see that I get a positive value, so that's concave up. Plug in negative 7. That's in between negative 5 pi over 2 and negative 3 pi over 2. I get negative, so it's concave down there. So then I plug in 
negative 4. It's positive, so I get concave up. In between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, I can plug in, say, negative 1. Here I get a negative value, so it's concave down. In between negative pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, okay, I plug in 2. It gives me 0. 0.42. That's positive, so it's concave up. Okay, 3 pi over 2 is 4.71, so I'll plug in 5. That's bigger. Into the second derivative, I get negative 0. 0.28. So it's negative, so it's concave down. And finally, I need to be bigger than 5 pi over 2, so I'll plug in 9. That gives me a positive, so it's concave up. So now let's go ahead and draw the graph. So I want to start by drawing my axes, and I want to make sure it stays between negative 10 and 10. And I have to put in all of those relevant x values that we had above. I like to make them line up with my number line from before. That makes things a little bit easier. OK, now we start by putting in the information that we know. f of 0 is negative 1. Okay. Now on each of our pieces of the graph, I want to draw in the general shape. So on this first piece, I can see that it's decreasing concave down, so I draw that shape. The next piece, it's concave down. I want the decreasing side, that right-hand side. So I only want that bent down, going down shape for my next interval. Now at pi over 3, it's concave up. It's still decreasing, so I draw that bent up concave up shape. And then on the next piece, it's going to be bent down, concave down. So I want to draw that shape hitting my intercept and going past it because 0 is not one of our endpoints of an interval. So we don't stop there. We just go right through it. At pi over 2, the concavity changes again. So it's going to be bent up, still decreasing. And then it goes bent down, still decreasing. And then finally, bent up and, decre and in decreasing, always decreasing. And that gives us our graph. If we wanted to label the inflection points, every one of those x values where the concavity changed is an inflection point. So negative 5 pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2, negative pi over 2, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and 5 pi over 2. But that's a lot, so we're not going to write those down now. It wasn't part of the question. But that's how we can get a shape of a graph um, from all of this derivative information.